Hi everyone, I'm Leslie. I am the person you never want to see outside the context of this wonderful educational environment because my team and I at Dragos are the people who show up on organizations' worst day ever when they are having a cybersecurity incident in their critical process environment. So basically, people see me for training, for talks, and they're like, I hope I never see you ever again. And I don't, I don't take any offense to that. When I end up in those worst days ever for these organizations, there's something that I find. I find that there's been a lot of assumptions. And those assumptions tend to be about organizations' capacity to do incident response, or even that they would have to deal with incident response in their OT environments. So first of all, let's nip this one in the bud. Every single one of us in this room, outside of it, who has a process environment can potentially have a cybersecurity incident in it. I keep running into organizations where they've made these assumptions. They have said things like, I'm too big to have a cybersecurity incident. I've got all these security controls, I've got this huge cybersecurity team, and it will never be me. And then somebody makes a human error, or something gets connected to the internet in the wrong way, a transient asset comes in, there's an insider, and they have a cybersecurity incident, and they're not ready for it. Or they think that they're too small and uninteresting to have a cybersecurity incident. And that's wrong because big bad adversary comes in and uses them as a test bed for an attack against a bigger organization. Or ransomware actor has a campaign and they're just a target of opportunity, but in the end, they have a cybersecurity incident, fortunately. So planning to do good incident response in your OT environment, not just your IT enterprise environment, is really important. This is something that can potentially happen to all of us, and I see it all the time. People just aren't ready. And like any other crisis we can potentially have in a process environment, in a life and safety environment, it's really important to drill these plans and procedures in advance. So today, I want to tell you about tabletop exercises for your OT environments, for your process environments, for cybersecurity incidents. Let's get on the same page here. What I'm talking about when I talk about a tabletop exercise, or TTX, is a totally safe practice of your incident response processes and procedures around a table. It's entirely in your brains and on pen and paper. You're not interacting with your critical systems. You're not touching anything. There's no concerns about messing up your process, creating a downtime window. You're getting all your stakeholders in incident response into a room, and you're talking through and testing your ability to go through your processes and procedures for that worst day ever. So I have a very short amount of time here, a very short amount of time here to tell you what a TTX is and give my elevator pitch on why you should be doing it. And then I want to give you a little crash course so you can make educated decisions about whether you need some help, if you need to bring in some outside parties to help you run a tabletop, or you're ready to do it internally, or whether you should be doing it yet at all, or you should be building some more basic cybersecurity architecture in advance. I want to tell you a little bit about how these tabletops in OT are different ones than ones you might have done in your IT environment, because incident response really is different in OT. That's why I specialize in that specifically. I'm going to tell you some gotchas that I always see happen in these tabletops so you can get ahead of them a little bit, and then the stuff that you'll need to develop to make these exercises happen. And I will tell you some things about measuring success, so how to quantify success in your tabletop exercises, because you know everybody loves KPIs, especially as you go up the ladder, right? All right. So you should, this is my elevator pitch. I'm not trying to sell you something here. You can do TTXs internally. If you have the capacity to do it, that's great. Just do them. Incident response in OT is not the same as incident response in IT. You have life and safety concerns. You're dealing with different types of systems. I often talk, talk to organizations that have made assumptions about this, and I'm like, so what happens if somebody tampers with this RT? What do you do forensically then? And there's like this, this look of shock on their faces, like, oh, I didn't think about that. Like, I don't know how to do forensics on that. What kind of cable does it take? Does it have a, some kind of firmware I can work with? I don't know. So we need to think through these things in advance. There's also all the, the safety decision making in terms of where you can do incident response, how you do it, who needs to be involved in decision making for things like containment. These environments are totally different. And the way that we do digital forensics and incident response in them is totally different. 
You need to be doing these discrete tabletops for those really important environments. Incidents are really high pressure. If you've never had to deal with a cybersecurity incident, they are scary. They are fast paced. Sometimes they happen at 2 a.m. on Christmas when everybody's hungover. Yeah, that's when the adversaries know. They know when to attack. Come on, they're, they're not stupid. <laughs> and there's a lot of stages and moving parts that need to happen to respond to these terrible days. So this is really important to do in a safe environment in advance. You need to practice these plans. You need to build these plans. You need to have an idea what these plans need to look like. And then you need to give them a shot in a safe environment. And there is no safer environment to test your plans than sitting in chairs like this and talking through it. But it's a little more complicated than that. So let's talk about that. First of all, to be able to do tabletop exercises, you need some basic prerequisite stuff, OK? So you need to have some procedures, even if they're back of a napkin. You need to have some idea of what your process is for incident response. So who gets called? How do you communicate? What are you going to do step by step? How are you going to do forensics, et cetera, et cetera? So you need to have something written down to follow. Otherwise, what are you drilling? You know. And that means that you need to have a basic understanding of who's involved. Who is going to be a member of your broader incident response team? Not just the cybersecurity people, but in OT, like who needs to be involved in safety decision making? Who are your business continuity planners? Um, would you need to have legal or HR potentially involved? So who are the stakeholders in incident response in your organization in OT? And what data sources do you have to work with? You're going to do some analysis, right? You're going to do some forensics. You might want to have an idea of what stuff you have to work with so that you can talk through those processes. And you need to have an understanding of what your worst day ever could potentially look like, right? That's, that's a difficult question sometimes. That can take a lot of time to talk through your crown jewels, what's really important in your environment. What is your terrible day in your, in your environment? That's not an easy question. You need to ask that at the highest levels. Is it life and safety issues? Could somebody get injured? Could they get killed? Is that your worst day ever? Is it your facility catching on fire? Is it your equipment getting damaged? So, once you start working down from there, you start making very realistic, scary scenarios of what that worst day ever could look like. And then you can figure out whether there's potentially a cyber cause of those hazards, of those potential terrible things that could happen. So those give you those ideas of what you should actually drill. So what could go wrong? Why might we need to respond to a cybersecurity incident? And finally, you need to have a willingness to play the game and be a good sport about it. I know this sounds really straightforward and really simple, but it's not. There is a lot of bad blood between IT, cybersecurity, and OT. We all know that. There's bad relationships out there, and that makes it challenging to do this stuff, right? Because people think that they're being graded, they're being audited, and they don't want to play nicely. So if you don't have cooperative players who are there to learn, to succeed, and to support each other, your tabletop isn't going to be a success. So if those things are not in place yet, you probably want to take a step back and look at those issues before you even start drilling stuff, because it's going to go awry. This is pretty basic, though. Almost everybody in here should be doing tabletop exercises. And then once you have those things in place, you have to begin the process of developing a TTX. So some simple questions you need to answer right away is, how long do we have to dedicate to this TTX? When are we going to do it? And who's going to be involved? Who are our IR stakeholders? And you can do a tabletop exercise with just your core IR cybersecurity people, or you can do one with your broader team of stakeholders. So everybody up to your executives, your OT people, your legal people, your corporate communications people, all of those would be involved in a cybersecurity incident. I'm not going to tell you one is better than the other. They're both different things. You're testing out different capabilities. You should do both. So you need to make decisions about that. Who's going to play? And then your scenario. Again, I told you, you need to have some idea of what a bad day might look like so that you can drill it out. And we'll talk about how you develop that in a formulaic way, because you're going to need to develop some documents to support that. Building a game is it's hard work. It takes a little time. What you're going to need to produce is a timeline. And from that timeline, you're going to select a series of injects. I'll show you what those looks like. If you are in the government or the military, you may have heard of this timeline with INJEX referred to as a MESL, a master scenario event list. I, I see a few nodding heads out there, people who are in the military. But in general, you're going to need to develop these two documents, which are a timeline and a set of INJEX. 
so your players have a game to play. And you're going to probably need to develop some documents, some collateral as well. So they'll probably need their documentation for how they handle an incident. They might need printouts of this timeline and inject that we'll talk about. But you're probably going to need to hand them some paperwork so that they're prepared to play the game well. Now, who here, I'm going to ask, I'm putting the audience on the spot. Who here has ever played a tabletop RPG? Dungeons and Dragons, GURPS, Pathfinder. Oh, there's some hands. Look, I thought there was going to be no one and I would just be standing up here like an idiot. Um, something that you will find as you play non educational games as you play recreational tabletop games is that players never do what you expect them to do. You will plan out a scenario for your players to go fight the dragon and they will decide to go to the pub and chat up a wizard instead. So that's, that's kind of how that works with these tabletops as well. Your players will never follow your plan for what is supposed to happen. You'll expect them to contain the malware and they will be like arguing over who to call about lunch or something. So that will happen. And that means that we need to have really good documentation and plans to try to keep them kind of on track as best as we can. And they're going to ask you questions, right, too, because we're playing this out on paper. They don't actually have access to do forensics on a computer. So they're going to ask you, hey, I did forensics on this computer. What did I find? So you don't want to be caught and have to like wing that. I do. It's fun. But really, you don't want to be caught and have to wing that. You want to have that written down. You want to have a good idea of everything that happened that the bad people did to the environment during your worst day ever, so that when they ask that question, you're like, well, you find this. And you, then you're ready to go. Then it's less threatening when your players are like, yeah, we're going to go to the pub and chat up the wizard. And you're like, you guys are doing cybersecurity incident response right now. There's no wizards. Um, but anyway, so you, you, want to, you want to build that good timeline and have those artifacts for them to find as they do pretend forensics and log analysis. And they look at their industrial devices and look at their process. And then you're going to select some stuff out of that timeline. So you've built this big timeline of the stuff that happens that the bad people did, big bad adversary did, or the malware did. And then you're going to select some visible things that they see happening that impact their response as injects out of that timeline. So the stuff that would impact their decision making and make them change course and make them escalate things, you're going to select a few of those, depending on the amount of time you have as your injects, and those are things you're going to announce on a schedule. So let's look at what this actually looks like. So here I show you an example of a timeline for a TTX. And those of you who have done incident response reports before are probably going, hey, that looks just like a timeline from an incident response report, because it is. You are making up an incident, right? You've got a timestamp, and you've got things in time order that the bad people did to the computers. So maybe they, they, did, they stole a computer. In this, you know, this is an exploitation of a computer using a phishing email. So there's a series of events that happens there, right, behind the scenes. So somebody clicks on the phishing email, then the computer gets exploited, and then the adversary gets onto the computer and they start moving laterally. Those all have times associated with them, right? Just like an incident report, you would read about an intrusion into an organization. And you can leave yourself some notes about where they might find records of those things if that helps you. But if they ask, hey, I checked my phishing security appliance to see if there was a phishing email, you go, yeah. And, and you check and you see that at 804, there was an email link clicked in an email that looks rather suspicious. And you've got that. It's written down. So they can't blindside you by going to talk to the wizard in the bar now. So you, you've got this ready to go. And um, now, now we have to choose some super special moments in this timeline to challenge them, which are our injects. And an inject ends up looking like this. We're picking some things that are visible. So in this case, we have an employee, Susan Jones, got her transient asset laptop stolen out of her car, and she called loss prevention. That's a thing that's visible to the security team. They got a call. That's a visible thing that happened in that timeline of events. There might be things happening behind the scenes there that they don't see until they start doing forensics and looking into their logs and things. But that's a thing that they know about. And they have to make some decisions, right? They have to make some decisions. They have to ask Susan some questions. They have to escalate that to the right people. And now they might have an incident on their hands, depending on their incident criteria. So these are things that push them to start making decisions about incident response, whatever part of the incident response team they are. So we select a few moments in time out of our timeline of what the bad people did that we developed. 
and then we say this is inject one, two, three, and they happen at x, y, z times. And so as we go through our tabletop exercise, we will every so often stand up and say, okay guys, this just happened. Susan Jones is on the phone, ring, ring. We might put this up on a big screen and say, she's called your loss prevention hotline and she says, my laptop's been stolen out of my car. And then later on, you might have a different inject as the adversary uses that laptop to VPN in and they tamper with a safety system and your process engineers call in and say, hey, I saw some wonky stuff happen. So that's how you develop these injects. You build that big timeline data dump of everything that happens that the bad people do, and then you select some stuff that's gonna educate your users. All right, so we've built our big timeline that just looks like a normal incident response timeline of stuff, so we're ready to go for our, most of the things that our players will do. And we selected some injects to read through during the course of the exercise. That's our exercise. Now we have to decide who's gonna play. So where are we going to hold this exercise? And who's going to do what? So you're gonna need some different roles in your tabletop, okay? You're gonna need a facilitator. So they are your game master, who have to deal with all this mayhem that the players come up with. They are the people who are reading off the injects. When people wanna go look in logs or talk to somebody who's in the game, they talk to that person and that, that facilitator has to be ready to say, you look in the log and you see X, Y, Z at this time, or yeah, you call so and so forth that I was totally not ready to have you call and this is what they say. You call Dragos and Dragos gives you this advice, whatever, you know, you, you call whoever, you call, you call uh, Sissa and Sissa says this. And so that person has to be ready to be flexible and kind of play the game, they're as prepared as they can be, but they are acting as all those roles for your players. And then you probably wanna have somebody taking notes and doing some grading. You know, however you're gonna do that, I'll, talk, I'll suggest a few things in this talk, but you probably wanna have somebody dedicated just to seeing how well you do and taking notes, et cetera, so that you can do better on the next exercise. And you'll have all your players, and you might have some observers. The, the thing that's risky about having observers just watching you play is that they're gonna to wanna to jump in they always wanna jump in. They're like, I'll just observe. And then they're, they're up front. Two hours later, they're up front in front of the whole table taking over the whole thing. So if you have observers, make sure it's very, very, very clear to them that they are observers and they are not playing the game. They cannot, they have to, yeah, it's hard. It's really hard, they're gonna to wanna to jump in. So be cautious about that. And for your injects that you've selected out of your timeline, you will want to kind of define those in advance. You'll kind of want to make sure you know when you're going to call out each one of the injects that you've selected. So again, those visible things that are going to change how their incident is progressing and what's changing as they go through the timeline of events. So you'll want to make sure that you know when you're going to call those out. And then you execute this. Then you're going to go play the game. It's fun. It's a game. You should be, you should be chill about this. It's, it's totally safe. You're just seeing whether things work or not. So you'll wanna make sure you've got a good environment to play in, conducive to practice. So you'll want to make sure that you can see everybody, hear everybody, everybody can get their voice in, um, that people are comfortable too. Now things are a little bit different now that a lot of events are hybrid or remote. The considerations are a little bit different there. If you're remote, make sure that there's no back channeling going on on other chats so that the raiders, the people who are running the exercise can see everything that's going on. And if you're in a hybrid environment, make sure that like, Everybody in a conference room is around the microphone so the remote people can hear them. So the normal challenges we face just escalated more so because there's a lot of people playing and you want them to be all able to equitably participate in the exercise. And make sure that somebody's taking good notes about what's happening. So if you're doing this remotely, you could potentially record it, but either way, you need somebody who's doing rating and recording. Um, if you're using collateral like documents, make sure they're distributed. The logistics of this aren't super complex, but if you don't do these things, it'll be a little uncomfortable. Here are some gotchas that you're going to run into, whether you run your own tabletop or you bring somebody in to help you, these things are going to happen, okay? And it's okay, it's okay, it's all right. First of all, don't get caught up in minutia. You will go down rabbit holes. You'll get in an argument over whether page 3B of your appendix of your incident response plan should be switched to 2A. Or should we really call Bob if he's on vacation? You know, like you will go down rabbit holes and you'll waste your entire exercise doing that and you don't wanna do that, okay? You want to gently try to keep your players on track a little bit. That's why you have the timeline and the injects.
but you don't want to push them really hard either. You want to, you know, let them fail. If they're going to fail, let them fail a little bit. That's how you learn. This is a safe environment. Nobody's actually going to get hurt. No catastrophes are really going to happen. You know, don't, don't get too caught up in everything happening exactly like you planned it. And you can decide when to give them a hint. If they're really getting stuck, if things are not proceeding, if they're not going to make it to the next inject OK, yeah, you can absolutely give them a hint as a facilitator. But you need to make careful decisions about that. That can be a little challenging. Again, your players are not going to do what you expect, and that's fine. In the end, the point of this all is to educate your team and make them feel better and more confident about doing incident response in a real crisis. So make sure everybody's chill about this. Again, they, you might be doing some rating, but that's just to track your progress. Nobody's going to get fired over this. It's chill. You know, get some pizzas in if it's in person. Have a nice lunch. Make sure that people are relaxed and know why you're playing this game. Know it's not an audit. And, you know, be ready to improv a little bit, right? Be ready to, to be chill and improv things that your players do that you don't expect. This is really different from doing IT, okay? This is, this is again, I do, I've done both IT and OT incident response, and your OT environment is very, very different, and that means you need to have OT people participate in your tabletop exercises because OT decisions have to be made. If you're talking about containment, cutting off network assets, cutting off potentially critical process systems, those people are not you. You don't get to make those decisions as cybersecurity people. You can advise, but the people who actually make those decision, decisions should probably be involved in your cybersecurity tabletop exercises. Your tooling is going to be different, right? You're not going to use the same forensics tools on your lower level devices or your legacy devices. Your systems may be less known to your incident response team as well, your cybersecurity personnel. So expect things to be different. Expect different issues to come up during this play. Safety issues are going to come up. Can you go in and do forensics on these systems when there's a potential process issue? Are you going to be able to do that on site? Can you get in there? Do you have the right PPE? All those things are going to come up in play. Um, you're going to have different plans and playbooks. So really, and there's going to be a heavy focus on containing the issue and making sure that things are safe and you're restoring service. Over enterprise, where you might have the luxury of doing a lot of forensics right away, you might need to get your process up and running safely immediately. That may be your top priority. So understanding those distinctions and priorities, technologies, et cetera, are an important thing you get out of doing these tabletops. And this is going to arise as you play. Some stuff that's going to go wrong, for sure. You're going to run into this. You're going to get players who fight the scenario, and you're going to have to calm them down. You're also going to be really uncomfortable because people are going to go off on their tangents to the bar with the wizard, and you're going to be like, come back. You need to do the network containment. Like, you're going to have to be gently guide them. Let them fail, but give them gentle guidance to keep them on track. You're not going to be totally prepared, and that's fine. You might not have people's complete attention, especially if they're remote, and that's challenging, too. And your scenario night might not be exactly realistic or accurate. And that's OK, too. Um, you might not have the right person there. You just have to adapt and overcome. Really, that's, that's the be all, end all there. Adapt and overcome. You're playing a game. It's safe. It's OK. But this stuff is going to happen. You're going to have a management call away somebody who's really critical to the exercise. And you might have to step in and improv and pretend to be them. That stuff is going to happen. It's OK. It happens to everybody. It happens to people like me who do these exercises professionally. It's all right. You'll want to measure your success. So you'll want to quantify your success in some manner. It could be based on people's success at different stages of incident response, like PCURL. It could also be on time to recovery or business continuity. You'll need to choose some criteria that you measure your exercises against. And you'll want to keep doing these exercises a lot. You want to do them at regular intervals. Like any other safety exercise, you have to drill, drill, drill. So when it happens at 2 AM on Christmas, you are ready. And in those exercises, you'll want to focus on different elements and stakeholder groups, make sure everybody's involved. And you'll want to focus on different critical scenarios, different worst days ever. So some final thoughts here. You should go home and plan a TTX. It's really, really, really important. With some basic caveats about maturity, you should be doing a TTX. If you're not ready to do it yourself, bring in an organization to help you. And consider this full life cycle I expressed of what goes into it, but you can totally do it. Just figure out how you're going to measure success. Don't worry about it being perfect. You're just, you're just playing a game. It's just a game. It's fun. Have some pizza. 
and document everything you do so you can do better next time. So thank you, everybody. Uh, do, if anybody has any questions, I would love it if you could come up and use the microphone right here so that it gets on the recording. That'd be very helpful. But I would love to answer any questions you have for my quick elevator pitch on how to do tabletop exercises. Or Dungeons and Dragons. You can ask me questions about Dungeons and Dragons, too. I don't mind. Given your experience um, in incident response, real life incident response, mm -hmm. what would you think the most two common well, uh, initial access vectors you see that should be included if you're, you're kind of baby stepping into this? So it's based on reality. And then uh, I'm kind of curious, after that, what are the most obvious systems you'd want to be able to do incident response or, or forensics on that are involved with those two scenarios? It depends a lot on the architecture of the environment, but I can tell you the three most ta common types of incidents that we respond to. So the first one is insider threat cases, both unintentional and intentional. So people doing things maliciously or people who just really want to watch Netflix in the process environment at three in the morning. <laughs> And uh, then the second one, of course, is commodity malware. So ransomware, you just get swept up in a campaign. Your credentials get reused, they get dumped on the dark web, and you're just part of the big money-making campaign. And the third one, of course, is the advanced adversaries, either intentional because they're doing foothold building or reconnaissance, or because they want to test out their attack and they think nobody's looking at your, your small organization. So all those things happen. I hope that gives you some food to thought for thought about initial access vectors. You know, thinking about those three types of cases and how they could potentially happen in your OT environment. How they actually get in is going to depend a lot on, do you really have a pretty decent DMZ going on? How, how full of holes is your DMZ? You know, do you have a really, do you follow the Purdue model pretty accurately? Do you have proper segmentation? Is it one big flat network? I mean, that's going to change things a lot. So I hope that gives you some ideas about, about where you might want to focus in your own environment. Sure. What else? Um, can you speak a little bit to like the maturity model of exercises within an organization? And maybe they do one and then they're like, oh, this was really rough. And then they don't do anything for six months. But can you talk Sorry. a little bit about the maturity curve for organizations who do this on an ongoing basis? You will, in your first exercise, your very first tabletop, you are going to learn so much. It will be drinking from a fire hose. And I talked really briefly, and I only had a few minutes, but some of the things that will go wrong, they just will go wrong. Your players will go in a different direction. Management won't be totally bought in. You'll be missing people. People will get distracted. All those things are going to happen, but still, you're going to learn a lot about your organization. You're going to reach an inject in your, in your exercise where you're like, do we have a firewall there? Does it have logs? Do we have any monitoring or visibility? We don't know how to do forensics on that. Who has access to that system? All those things are going to come up as you play. So your, your increase in maturity is going to be drastic after your first decent, honest, bought-in tabletop exercise. It's really going to help you. I promise I'm not trying to sell you anything. Thank you. Why, hello there. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Sure. Um, so my question was about metrics used to you know, score the incident yeah. responders, especially, you know, as this is repeated activity, what are kind of preferred metrics? And I heard you use the term p-curl, what's that? Yes, so p-curl is one of the life cycle models. And you know, academic models are academic models. They're, they're like the Purdue model, like they're, they're okay. They're not really realistic for everything. But p-curl is one of the models that describes the life cycle for incident response from preparation to lessons learned. It includes containment, recovery, et cetera. So you're breaking your incident response efforts into stages, and then you can look at each stage in an independent focus. So how did you do on containment? Were you able to contain the threat? Were you able to keep the adversary from infecting more computers or doing more bad stuff? And for recovery, how fast could you potentially get your systems up and running again? So that's one way that you can gauge success, is look at those incident response stages. But like I mentioned, you could also measure time to recovery from a business continuity planning perspective. You're supposed to have a certain amount of uptime. That's a perfectly good way to do it, too. It's going to depend on your environment and how you want to measure success. Great, thank you. Of course. I don't know if I'm getting cut off on questions. This might be the last one we have time for. But I'm happy to talk to people in the hallway afterwards. Thank you. Um, of course. 
I'm just curious if forensics is ever successful in OT and, and given ah. the level of devices, given the incident. Uh, I, I just pretend to do this. No, no, really, it is. It is. Um, um, yes, we do quite a lot of forensics in OT. Um, at the higher levels, f systems are pretty familiar. A lot of windows out there, a lot of legacy windows. You have to be able to go back and do like forensics on Windows NT, which is a different challenge. A lot of people never learned how to do that. But for the low level devices, yes, you can absolutely do forensics on them. You have to learn a lot about the system, so you have to kind of reverse engineer it. You have to re reverse engineer it from a physical perspective. So what's the interface? You have to build a plug. And then what does it actually log? A lot of them do have some pretty good telemetry in them. Some of them have logging. Um, it depends on the system, the vendor, what they design, and you just have to find that out. Some of the systems are better documented than others. You know, some of the organizations out there really did document where they log things for the sake of diagnostics, but other things are old or they're undocumented and you're digging through them to try to find if there's anything useful on them. Now there's stuff like historian data too, which can be very useful for forensics that's un it's a little bit different from IT because you're suddenly looking at process data. So what happened to the process? But that can be very relevant to forensics too. So yes, we do lots of forensics on both high level and low level devices in industrial networks. And it can be challenging. It's very different than doing enterprise forensics where you maybe have agents. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's no next gen EDR in, your, in most of your OT environments. So you don't have that luxury of what people are used to in cybersecurity today. You have to do manual old school forensics, sometimes on very old systems.